Well, uh, good morning um, and welcome to the conference uh, reassessing the Franco-Prussian War 150 years on. Um, my name is Michael Rowe uh, and I am reader of European history in King's College London um, and it's my pleasure and privilege to, to welcome you um, to this conference um, and to uh, have the opportunity to make some opening um, remarks. Um, I would like to begin uh, by thanking Colonel Almel de Roux, uh, who's the army attaché in the French Embassy, London. Um, it was Colonel de Roux who took the first steps in arranging this conference. Um, that was way back in September 2019, uh, when he reached out to my colleague, Professor Joe Maolo, director of the Sir Michael Howard Center for the History of War. And it was uh, uh, our Mel's idea um, that we should mark the, the 150th anniversary of the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-71. Um, and I guess befitting of a, of a cavalry officer, it's really been his drive that has provided a lot of forward momentum uh, at various crucial junctures over the last um, one and a half years. Colonel de Roux, apart from pursuing an active and distinguished military career, has published several works on uh, French irregulars in, in the war of 1870-71. Um, on a, a previous uh, stint in London, he held a research, a visiting research fellowship at King's uh, whilst at the same time attending the Royal College of Defence Studies. And it was at this time that he reached out to Sir Michael Howard, uh, indeed to whose home he was invited for afternoon tea and exchanges on the Franco-Prussian War um, followed. And one of the outcomes of these exchanges um, is this conference, which is uh, to honor uh, Sir Michael Howard, who of course sadly passed away um, uh, at the end of um, 2019. As I'm sure you're all aware, um, Sir Michael Howard wrote arguably the most important book on this conflict, uh, first published in 1961, um, The Franco-Prussian War, The German Invasion of France, 1870-71, received uh, immediate acclaim from historians based on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, somebody whose work I know very well, Gordon Craig, distinguished historian of Germany, described uh, Sir Michael's book as a model of what a study in military history should be. And it's an, an accolade which, um, although written in the early 60s, remains um, valid today as, as it did then. So a seminal study, um, uh, seminal for the, the, the discipline of, of military history, um, uh, not only for the history of the 1870-71 war, uh, several because of course it treated the conflict as one between armies um, that were shaped by the societies from which they sprang. Um, reading you know various transcripts of interviews with Sir Michael Howard and there's a, there's a particularly good one uh, from 2008 where, where Sir Michael Howard spoke about the discipline of history. This is um, if you're interested you can access it on the, His uh, the Institute of Historical Research website um, by simply typing in Sir Michael Howard. And, you know, getting a, a sense of what attracted him to the Franco-Prussian War as a subject. And uh, really, you know, reading, reading that transcript and also other, um, other interviews, um, and indeed the sort of preface of, of, of the, the original edition and the later edition, um, I think what attracted Sir Michael Howard was one, it was between two belligerents um, other than Britain. And so he felt that he could um, write something which was slightly distant and dispassionate, a, a judicious survey. Um, but the second, and I think for me more interesting reason is that of course the war of 1870, 71 was located more or less halfway between the, the still pre-industrial wars of uh, Napoleon, that's the first Napoleon, and the industrial carnage of 1914 to 1918. And I was struck by something which you know, Sir Michael Howard uh, 
points out in his book, you know, it's, it's amazing to think that amongst the participants in the 1870 war um, were a few uh, individuals who had fought in the later stages of the Napoleonic Wars, uh, of course, most famously, um, the Prussian King, Wilhelm I, and one of his field marshals, Karl Friedrich von Steinmetz. Um, they're both present, certainly Wilhelm is present at Waterloo, um, and, and Steinmetz is present at various key battles, I think at Leipzig in 1813, uh, and, and the, the various battles of a Hundred Days campaign, if not Waterloo. They're there um, uh, in 1870. Um, but so is Paul von Hindenburg, um, you know, who will, of course, play such a leading role in the First World War. Um, so the War of 1870-71 comes across as, uh, as a war of transition, um, one which blends features of the era of Napoleon I with those of the First World War. Um, a, a war of, of still of cavalry engagements, of, of splendid uniforms of monarchs, Napoleon III and, um, and Wilhelm uh, leading their armies, uh, at least uh, symbolically, um, uh, but also a, a war of, um, of dog tags, um, of uh, massive artillery, uh, a, a power uh, of telegraph of railways. Um, and of course, most importantly, or um, a war where um, civil society is mobilized, certainly after Sudan on the French side, not in the same way as, you know, Spanish guerrillas who, um, who resist the first Napoleon, that form of resistance, of course, goes back um, much earlier than 1808, but um, a form of resistance and mass mobilization within a sophisticated, uh, industrial and indeed service sector society, which of course is what France is in 1870 um, at, at the end of the so-called Second Empire. So of course, this transition, if you like, is, is marked within the war itself, um, the, the war up to and including the Battle of Sedan and then that post-Sedan phase, which of course sees more casualties um, and, and more trauma really on both sides than the first phase. Um, I, you know, looking at Sir Michael Howard's book, it does seem appropriate that the subject of that book, which is one of transition, um, but the work itself, in, in a way, marks an important transition in the evolution of military history um, as a subject. Um, so there's a nice um, symmetry there. Uh, Sir Michael Howard, of course, lives on in his scholarship to a, 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 a much wider audience and circle, uh, and he also lives on in the centre to which he has given his name, the, the Sir Michael Howard Centre for the History of War. And it's under the auspices of the centre, um, and also the auspices of the French Embassy uh, in London that this event is being held. Uh, the, the Sir Michael Howard Centre, so the SMHC uh, for short, was founded in 2014-15, that academic year, um, to promote um, the scholarly history of war, um, really in all its dimensions, so very much following uh, uh, Sir Michael's sort of philosophy um, on how to approach the subject. Um, the the uh, centre uh, promotes uh, active research um, amongst uh, PhD students, it has a flourishing uh, MA programme in the history of war, and it hosts uh, projects and, and conferences um, like this one. So it thereby promotes the study of the history of war, really covering the whole swathe of, um, of history, the whole chronology from the ancient world really to the very recent past and you know, dealing with war, not simply as a matter of armed services, but very much as, as um, something which impacts societies as a whole. Um, in this context, actually, I'd like to advertise that the Sir Michael Howard Centre annual lecture, uh, 2021, so the next lecture, and that's going to be held um, on the 1st of December. Um, and the speaker we have lined up is Dr. Erica Charters um, from Oxford University. I'm sure many of you will know her and know her 
work or know her through her um, most important work to date, and that's her book, monograph, um, entitled Disease, War and the Imperial State, the Welfare of British Armed Forces During the Seven Years' War, and that was published in 2014. So uh, Erica Charters is a historian um, whose work focuses really on disease and war, on medicine and war, so brings in a very interesting sort of history of science uh, approach. Um, the title of her, um, of her lecture is to be confirmed, um, but please do make a note um, of this in your diary. So that's the 1st of December, um, 2021, uh, that, that we will be welcoming um, Dr. Charters. Um, I would also like to mention that the center will be running uh, a seminar program um, soon, beginning of next academic year. So the end of September, early October, 2021. And this uh, is entitled New Directions in the History of Warfare uh, and Violence. Um, further details will be available on the Sir Michael Howard Center website. Um, so please um, stay tuned. Of course, you can also um, follow us on uh, Twitter as well for more details of these and uh, indeed other forthcoming events. Um, as I previously noted, the co-sponsor of this conference is the French Embassy in London, the Embassy uh, for its support and um, pass on to you the best wishes of Her Excellency Mrs. Catherine Colonna, uh, the Ambassador of France, and she writes to us, uh, and I quote, this conference marking the 150th anniversary of the Franco-Prussian War's end in 1871 is a unique opportunity to emphasize how much the European enterprise has helped us rebuild our continent following three successive conflicts between France and Germany, the most recent being the Second World War. I'm delighted to see such a wide range of speakers contributing to thinking on this subject, and I wish this event every success. Uh, it should also lead to a publication, um, and indeed, uh, that is that last point is, is something that we plan more details to follow after the conference. Um, I also need to pass on my thanks to Dr. Mark Kondosh, uh, a lecturer in, in war studies. Um, he's been, of course, in touch with you over the, 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 the last few months. Um, I think it was the elder Moltke to whom is attributed the remark, kein plan überlebt die erste Feindberührung, which I think can only be translated as no plan survives first contact with the enemy. Of course, in our case, uh, that enemy has been the COVID uh, pandemic, which you know started a few months after those initial meetings between Joe and myself and uh, Aramel. Um, but you know, like Moltke, we've adapted, we've made use of new technology, and much of that extra organizational effort um, has been borne by Mark, uh, by by Mark Kondos, and also by um, Danny uh, McDivitt. Um, who is the website and events officer for the School of Security Studies, um, I was going to say here at King's, at King's, um, and, you know, she's, she's helped with the complex logistics of organising um, an event which has had to go online, and she's really been indispensable, uh, and we are going to be in her hands um, over the, the next day and, uh, and a bit. Um, so special thanks to, to Danny. Um, and also um, Danny's team, I think that's fair to, to describe them as such, uh, Aisha Khan and Lizzie Ellen. Um, so they'll be, um, they'll be looking after us um, in, in IT terms over the, the, the day, uh, over the next day and a bit. Um, actually, uh, while I'm on the sort of practical IT side of things, I should mention um, that, um, these opening remarks, of course, are being recorded, but so will all the panels. So be aware of that, they're being recorded. Um, I think there will be up to 200 or perhaps close even to 300 people um, in, involved in, in the audience. Um, so I think under those circumstances, it makes sense to, uh, 
make use of a question and answer function um, rather than the hand function and for questions to be, uh, you know, which might be quite numerous to be managed and clustered uh, using the Zoom function, the Q&A function on Zoom. Um, just a couple of updates on the program. Um, Danny sent out the, um, um, the, the latest kind of what we thought would be the latest and possibly final iteration of a program either yesterday or the day before. Um, but there have been a couple of changes this morning, which I should flag at least one change, and that affects panel four this afternoon. Um, that's the panel entitled The Impact of the Franco-Prussian War Military Fort. And it's, it's um, uh, uh, Dr. Huam uh, Lasconjare um, has, has dropped out, which is a, is a shame since I think we're all looking forward to his paper on Foch and the intellectual legacy. Um, of the Franco-Prussian War. So that means there'll only be two um, papers um, uh, for that panel, uh, those by Robert Foley and, and Robert Johnson. Um, those papers might sort of be a little bit longer uh, or and or the virtual drinks can be sort of brought forward um, a, a little bit. And then of course the big change which you already should be aware of is um, uh, tomorrow morning, um, where we did originally have a, a panel planned, but um, that's been sort of consolidated and merged with the earlier panels. So we will have a, a fairly sort of late start tomorrow morning, 11 a.m. with opening remarks, uh, and then we'll have we'll move on to the round table at 11:30, which will be the sort of concluding event of this um, conference. Um, and I'm just going to quickly. See, yes, great. I, I see Anna Ross is um, is in. Um, what will normally happen between panels um, and events where there, there are larger breaks is that Danny will, um, I think, sort of deactivate things. So you will kind of have to log out at that point and then log in for the next panel. And that's really so as to ensure that everyone gets a, a bit of a break. We're not going to do that though um, now between the opening marks and panel one. So we'll just sort of seamlessly move, uh, I hope, from one to the other. Um, okay, I think I've actually completed my opening comments uh, a little bit earlier. And Anna, I hope you're sort of getting ready because we could possibly start your panel five minutes or so earlier. Um, which would be no bad thing since your panel is um, is the only one actually which has four um, speakers, so it's it's a slightly heavier panel than the others. Um, so it might sort of relieve a bit of pressure on you. Um, Anna, are you ready to go if you wish to? Yes, absolutely. I think that makes sense, Michael. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I'll I'll hand over to you and mute myself. Okay, great. Um, well, I'm delighted to be here and to introduce our speakers um, for the panel, um, Politics, Geopolitics of the Franco-Prussian War. Um, what I'll do is I'll introduce all four speakers to start off with, uh, and then um, call upon the speakers to give their papers. And I think that that might um, hold the time together a bit more. And I, I'll keep my eye on the Q&A function. So please, as we're going through, pop, pop questions in there and we'll assemble them at the end. Um, so our first speaker is Oliver Jayek, um, director of the IESD at U Université jean moulin Lyon 3. Um, he's written a whole range of wonderful articles on uh, geostrategy, so thinking about spatial categories and strategic um, uh, ideas and ge geopolitics in general, um, and also some wonderful um, stuff that I, I looked at um, on realism in, in international relations. So he'll be speaking to us first about um, geopolitics of the Franco-Prussian War. Uh, he'll be followed then by um, Professor Jeffrey Waro, uh, who's Professor of Military History at the University of North Texas and Director of the UNT Military History Center. Um, many of us will be familiar, familiar with Professor Waro's uh, Franco-Prussian War, um, uh, the book he published with Cambridge back in 2003, um, and more recent work on uh, American soldiers uh, in the First World War, um, most notably in the book Sons of Freedom. Um, and he'll be speaking to us today on the Franco-Prussian War as the Third War of German Unification. 
Then we'll have our third speaker, Christoph Nubel, who is a Wissenschaftlicher Oberrat um, at the Zentrum für Militärgeschichte und Sozialwissenschaften der Bundeswehr in Potsdam. Um, and and uh, amongst his um, uh, many publications that I looked up and, and fascinating works there, um, I draw your attention to um, uh, Der Staat gestürzt auf Blut und Eisen, uh, the military kind of thinking in uh, Bismarck's political thought. I thought that might be particular relevant um, of relevance to our, our um, community here. And he'll be speaking on Bismarck, 1870, and the problem of civil military relations in Germany. Finally, um, to end off the panel, we'll have uh, Dr. Karin uh, Varley, who is a lecturer in French and European history at the University of Strathclyde. Um, she has obviously, um, and many of you will be familiar with her work on Under the Shadow of Defeat, the War of 1870 to 71 in French memory. So thinking about the Franco-Prussian War and its impact um, on, on French culture. Um, she's been working, doing a lot of work recently on the Second World War, um, but is coming back to the Franco-Prussian War to think about it as a European turning point. Um, and so she'll be talking to us about European neutrality and the isolation of the French Republic, September 1870, to March 1871. So I'll ask, first of all, um, Dr. Jayek to, to begin, uh, and you'll have 15 uh, minutes up to, 15 to 20 minutes, a maximum of 20 minutes. Uh, thank you, and, and good morning to uh, all uh, my colleagues and the, the attendants. Uh, it is really an honor to, to be there with you this morning for uh, this panel and this uh, conference. So, um, so, um, uh, uh, my, my, my subject is uh, um, about geopolitics of the Franco-Prussian War. This is a quite uh, difficult subject because uh, I, I will have to be a little bit uh, simplistic and uh, uh, really uh, straightforward on this due to the limited time we have. But um, one of the most important events in the contemporary history of Europe, um, the Franco-Prussian War, have had tremendous consequences, as we know, in terms of territorial control and special balance on the continental scale. So as such, we can say that it is a moment that can be analyzed geopolitically. Um, this war, a uh, very fascinating moment in our common history, represents a pivotal moment uh, in a way, between two opposing trends in European special organization. Um, territorial simplification on the one hand and uh, fragmentation on the other. And this war, which saw the completion of the German unification movement, historical movement under the Aegis of Prussia, was a moment of coagulation and territorial simplification in Europe. Nevertheless, this moment of coagulation finds its epilogue, as we all know, with the First World War, which has quite opposite consequences, that is a territorial fragmentation of the European continent. And one of the possible interpretation of this paradox is perhaps contained in the seeds of what could effectively be called the geopolitics of this war. That is the special uh, response that the Frankfurt Treaty brought to the power equation that preceded the conflict. So it is the form and the context of this response that I propose to review in this the first part of uh, this presentation. I, I say overview, uh, because given the time available to us, this picture can only be both simplistic and I would say uh, synthetic. So such a space-centric analysis is not quite sufficient um, to answer to the terms of the subject proposed to me by my friend, uh, Colonel Armel Diroux. Uh, it seems to me that when we speak about the geopolitics of this war, it is also necessary to take an interest in the relations that unite this very particular conflict. And geopolitics uh, understood as an intellectual phenomenon uh, that is a special social, spatial study uh, 
of the forms of power rivalries. And this aspect will, will constitute the second point of this uh, intervention. So um, um, first of all, um, I mentioned a moment ago the, that the, um, the Franco-Prussian War was the starting point of a new European territorial concentration. This mainly concerns, as, as we all know, the Kingdom of Italy and the German Empire, which are completing their unification. Nevertheless, from a geopolitical point of view, there is a, a huge difference between these two beneficiaries of the conflict. Unlike the German one, the Italian uh, unification completed with the capture of Rome did not lead to a coagulation of power. After the war, uh, Italy did, uh, after the war, um, it uh, didn't take part. Uh, Italy fully integrates the European balance of power, but in a secondary position. The German case, of course, is obviously quite different. Thanks to the war, Germany becomes indeed the, the, the most economically and militarily powerful nation on the continent. And with unification, the geopolitical center of gravity of Europe has shifted to the east and Berlin is now the venue for major international conferences. The new empire can therefore play a dominant role in international relations. And the geopolitical question that led to the war of 1870-71 is not, however, the unification of Germany. A much larger questioning exists, does exist, uh, which is not resolved by the conflict. It goes on long after Frankfurt, in fact. And this question is, what is Germany's destiny in Europe? Is Germany a barycenter? the barycenter of a continental equ equilibrium that does not threaten its neighbors despite its potential power? Or is it structurally a voracious hegemon whose dynamic will be fatally aggressive? Quite modern question, uh, if I may. And one of the European leaders who, who tended to favor the first solution was Napoleon III himself. We know his hesitation between, on, one, on the one hand, the self-interested defense of the principle of nationalities in Europe, and on the other hand, the search for balance between empires that would have been relatively favorable to France. Um, in this perspective, um, in 1863, just after the failure of the Paris Conference, uh, Goltz, the Prussian ambassador in France, or to France, reported those words addressed to King William uh, Wilhelm uh, by uh, the French emperor. They can be found in the, the Auswärtige Politik Preußens um, uh, Documente. It is, it is quite striking, in fact. So uh, I've reproduced those, those words here. Uh, I had wished, blah, blah, blah. And uh, the striking words are those, Prussia is surrounded by a host of small states which hindered her action without adding to her strength. I had hoped that the meeting of the sovereigns would give us or could give us the occasion to establish between us an agreement in this respect, as well as on the other great questions. And Gold's ambassador further commands to the address of his sovereign uh, is he would have wished, so Napoleon, that your majesty had hastened to agree with him to rectify the map of Europe. Was Napoleon sincere? It is a possibility. And if he was, it is a proof of naivety. And the question is, this is difficult, but the French emperor uh, seems to have really doubt that uh, a strong Prussia could be an integral part of the European balance under the condition, of course, that this satisfied, so-called satisfied Prussia would not have been too strong. That is to say that France would have been territorially reassured on the Rhine. 
if this may appear as very naive in retrospect, it should be noted that Napoleon did not seem to have been the only one to enter entertain this type of geopolitical illusions in Europe uh, prior to the war. From the point of view of the European power equation, geopolitics of the Franco-Prussian war points, of course, also to the United, United Kingdom. And even if London does not lose any territory after the war, this, not, this does not mean that London's position is not politically weakened. As uh, Otte writes in a recent, very interesting re uh, research article, I quote him, one notes the failure of, a, of the por foreign policymaking elite to appreciate the significance of the rise of Prussia and the dangers this would pose to European stability. Um, we could um, say that this kind of geopolitical blindness existed before the war, as shown by London's relatively static diplomacy during the uh, Schleswig-Holstein crisis of 1863-64 somehow concentrated on the Eastern question or the Russian imperial challenge in Central Asia, Britain failed to appreciate fully that the territorial concentration created by the German unity under the Prussian scepter uh, was, uh, um, sorry, uh, changed the European balance far more than it has expected. And if I may, I would say that this relative blindness appears throughout uh, those three words in English, Franco-Prussian war. Is it indeed? Uh, we could consider that the real Franco-Prussian war occurred in 1806. Uh, in 1870 71, it is a Franco-German war. And geopolitically speaking, so to say, in terms of the special balance of power in Europe as a war, uh, that difference changed absolutely everything. If, you, if we try to simplify, and I, I, I apologize in, advan in advance for this, if we, if we try to simplify the problematic, problematics uh, using the undoubtedly crit criticizable, um, criticable um, macro geographic visions that are those of geopolitics, um, uh, the map linked to uh, the stakes of the war can be presented in the uh, following way. In 1869, uh, one of the issues at stake in Europe was the Southern German vacuum. And after 1866, the game was over for Vienna. So uh, by succeeding in dragging the political actors of Southern Germany into a national war against France, um, Bismarck definitely settled the question of this vacuum to the advantage of Prussia. So after the Austrian option of a great Danubian Germany around Vienna, the last alternative combination disappears, namely the Rhine policy of Paris, which Napoleon III could have perhaps liked to see lead to a balance between the influence of Paris and Berlin in this strategic zone. Let us recall uh, the words of Galtz in 1863. And this is not the case. Uh, the winner takes all and uh, um, the new balance of Europe becomes uh, this. So it is really a new balance. There is sometimes the impression one gets from what is called the Bismarckian system uh, on whose equilibrium uh, we insist. But there is an another hypothesis, of course. And uh, um, is it um, that this solution had nothing of an equilibrium or balance even before the advent of uh, uh, Wilhelm II? It could be only be it, it, it could only be provisional and prob problematic problematic insofar as the forces and the values that had been mobilized to realize uh, um, this, um, this objective uh, 
in 1870-71 could no longer be contained even by the prudence of Bismarck. Cartographically here, the result of the war simplifies European geopolitics. The main players remained apparently the same in the form of a quite stable oligopoly. But when it comes to a relative power, that is to say on a dynamic level, this war really changed the entire European political equation. There was no longer any question of concert. Um, sized in its potential dynamics, the New Deal forced Moscow and London to position themselves uh, differently to counter the exceptionally rapid, quick, and successful rise of power um, of Berlin. To complete this subject, uh, which can't but being oversimplified in 20 minutes, and I apologize for this. It seems to me that it might be interesting uh, to evoke uh, in the last uh, part uh, for the few minutes uh, I, I have, um, the very particular form of human geography that emerged from the uh, Franco-German War of 1870-71. Uh, Along with the geopolitical dynamics linked to and created by this war, I associate, in other words, what will become an extremely singular dynamic geopolitics. And uh, the connection between the two um, phenomena, the political one and the anti intellectual one can perhaps help us to cl clarif clarify the nature of the zeitgeist resulting from the war and thus to make a contribution to the question of whether Frankfurt was uh, you know, inevitably and avoidably leading to Verdun. So um, among the um, specialists of uh, human geography in Europe at this time, the most, of course, striking example of the cultural turning point that interests us is undoubtedly that of uh, Friedrich Ratzel, the German pioneer of political geography and geopolitics. Um, his, his major works were all published in the 25 years following the war. Anthropogeographie, uh, from 1882 to 1891, uh, and also Politische Geografie, Geografie in 1897. So Rat Ratzel was a combatant during the war, a conflict in which he was inval invalided, losing his hearing in the ear, uh, in one ear. So according, for example, to Klein and Bessin, this experience deepens in Ratzel a profound sense of German nationalism, but more important than that, reinforced his belief that war was a natural condition of world history. Uh, Klinke, in a, a very interesting article published um, two years ago, goes even further, writing that Ratzel's Lebensraum would be thanatological in essence, and that the specter of death and survival involved in this concept derives directly from the wartime experience of the geographer. So Ratzel is not the only geographer to be linked to this war. Uh, Karl Ritter in Germany, for example, had um, has influenced Moltke, as we as, as we know. But Ratzel, much younger than uh, uh, Ritter, represents a completely different era for European geography at the confluence of biological principles and vitalist philosophy. Can we consider in this way that this vision of a dynamic and bio-conditioned political geography and soon of geopolitics uh, can be limited to the German uh, to a German phenomenon. Uh, some people think so, uh, but I, I, I'm not really convinced. Um, as a lot of scholars underline it, uh, Paul Vidal de la Blache, uh, 
the most influential geographer of the early 20th century in France was also deeply conditioned by the Franco-Prussian War as a formative intellectual experience. Vidal was only 25 years old at the time of the, of the war. He was in Paris during the Commune from where he escaped to Versailles. And also, uh, also he was not a soldier himself, he was nevertheless traumatized by the, this war. Um, his career is interesting then because a teaching at the sim very symbolic University of Nancy, Nancy in Lorraine, he quickly became after the war, one of the symbols of the, a new French geography that was part of a national intellectual and scientific rearmament influenced by the analysis of the causes of the defeat. What is interesting here is that Vidal de la Blache is not only the major French geographer of the early 20th century, he is also a precursor, a pioneer of geopolitical approaches as shown in his, his work, uh, La France de l'Est, Eastern France, published in 1917. Vidal's questioning focuses above all on the dynamics of nation building. And indeed, the war, the Franco-German war, encored him in a direct relationship with the German model. Um, Vidal enrolled his son, his proper son, in the German University of Darmstadt. Uh, he traveled to Germany in the early nine, uh, 1880s, as we can see from his notebooks, which were just published last year for, for the first time. Uh, very interesting um, uh, reading. He met Ratzel. It, it is not that Vidal imitates the author of Lebensraum. It would be more accurate to say that in their way of inventing a vitalist political geography for their time and for their respective countries, Vidal and Ratzel are influenced in a parallel way by the same foundational trauma, the war. Um, and on this point, I think we should stop following Lucien Febvre, who in 1922 in La Terre et l'Evolution Humaine opposed German determinism to the French possibilism in a political geography, as if you know, to deny any Ratzelian impregnation uh, in Vidal's work. In reality, one could say that the shared experience of war brought their conception closer together. Um, and their shared vitalism uh, is expressed in the form of a politicized dynamic anthropogeography. Um, they were very influential after the war in Germany, in France and outside those, uh, those two countries. So um, one point to conclude that strikes me personally is the transposition that can be made between the character of the Franco-German war of 1871 on the one hand and the character of this new vitalist political geography on both sides of the Rhine on the other hand. The war of 1870 as mentioned by Michael Rowe at the beginning of this conference, marked an evolution in military strategy insofar as it illustrated the passage from classical warfare to industrial warfare. And it is quite fascinating to note that the German and French political geography influenced by the conflict will operate a synthesis of the same type. In Ratzel and Vidal de la Blache works, we find a paradoxical balance between, on the one hand, a naturalist and organicist approach stemming from a pre-industrial past and at the same time, a more technical approach adapted to the very dynamic description of an economically globalized post-war period in which the notion of distance uh, takes on a new geostrategic meaning. And in, the, in this vitalist philosophy, the notion of balance or harmony counterbalances that of efficiency. So um, from then, it appears to us that the paradox that I mentioned at the beginning of this paper of this uh, communication is perhaps not a paradox at all. This war was, as we all know, an 
intellectual as much as, much as a strategic turning point. It led uh, to a political balance whose apparent Bismarckian statics poorly conceal the uh, intrinsic turbulence. If the Franco-Prussian or the Franco-German war has indeed led to a spatial coagulation from a geopolitical point of view, the intellectual approaches to special order to which it has, it has given rise at the same time largely contradict this appear, appearance of both simplification and balance. From this point of view, considering what would be a ge geopolitics of the Franco-Prussian war, um, it Im implies uh, reinserting it in a broader framework, uh, the broader framework of the history of ideas, and in particular, that of the specialization of the concept of power. Thank you for your attention and uh, really uh, sorry for having been uh, perhaps too long. No, that, that was perfectly one or two minutes over. So that was perfect. And what a, a really fascinating um, paper you've given us to, to start things off. Um, I've got half a page of notes there. That was fabulous. Um, we're now going to have, my understanding is um, our talk from um, Professor Waro, um, but it's going to be played as a pre-recorded video. Um, so um, perhaps, Oliver, if you could stop screen sharing. Of course. Uh, and then the team uh, should be able to pop that up, is my understanding. Hello to everyone present, uh, virtually, of course. I want to make a fond uh, mention of Sir Michael Howard, who I dedicated my last book to. He was one of my great advisors, mentors, friends over the, over the years, and I know we all miss him so very much. Now, Bismarck and Moltke power over the title of my paper, The Franco-Prussian War as the Third German War of Unification, or Deep Oz. Imagine, just two years before Bismarck became Prussian minister president, the Times of London had scoffed, Prussia unaided would not keep the Rhine of the Vistula for a month. The kingdom was relatively small and divided into Western and Eastern halves, with fiercely independent German states like Hanover sandwiched in between the halves. Voltaire had called Prussia that kingdom of mere border strips. Prussia's population before 1866 was barely half the population of France or Austria. Prussian politics were savage, the Junker class clinging to ancient privileges and resenting Bismarck's efforts to centralize power in his own hands. The liberal business class that made the Zollverein resenting Bismarck's authoritarianism. And the people of Western Prussia despising the people of Eastern Prussia as Polakians, Hinterpommerns, or Stinkpoisen. In the years before 1870 and even after, Westphalian fathers sending their sons off to perform their military service lamented that their boys were serving with the Prussians as if it were a foreign country, which in a way it was. How Prussia became a great power, history tells us, the Times of London declared in 1860. Why she remained so, nobody can tell. Bismarck, besieged by all of these forces in the 1860s, staked his entire career on the Austro-Prussian War of 1866. Victory in its spoils, Austria yeah. driven from German affairs, and Prussia enlarged by 7 million new subjects and 1,300 square miles of new territory, solved all problems in Prussia. The Junkers and the Liberals were won over. The Junkers, by Bismarck's determination, to stitch the authoritarian Prussian system onto a new Germany, the Liberals, by Bismarck's great strides toward national unification. Prussia had had one third the inhabitants of France in 1820, one half in 1860, and after 1866, it nearly evened the score. 30 million Prussians to France's 38 million. Because this enlarged Prussia and North German Confederation had universal conscription, the shift in the military balance was even more striking. 
Prussia added 35 infantry regiments and seven corps. Prussia now had a fully mobilized army of 1.2 million, three times larger than the fully mobilized French army on the eve of the Franco-Prussian War of just 400,000. For France, the surprise de Sadova, the surprise of Sadova, the rapid and unexpected Prussian expansion in 1866 made a Franco-Prussian war likely. Napoleon III had lost face, reviled at home for losing first Italy and now Germany and for putting French power and influence at risk. The 1860s were horrible for Napoleon III. Italy unified against his wishes. He failed in efforts to reconstitute Poland. Bismarck crushed Austria and created the North German Confederation, rejecting all of Louis Napoleon's demands for compensation in Belgium and Luxembourg. And after spending today's equivalent of a billion dollars in Mexico, Napoleon III was forced to pull out in 1867 with nothing to show for the venture. The French emperor, weak, ill, and unpopular, could be counted on to provoke a war over any further Prussian attempt to expand, namely into South Germany. The three states there, Bavaria, Württemberg, and Baden, contained 8 million more Germans, 200,000 well-trained troops, and their territory would permit a unified German state the ability to invade France on a broad front from Luxembourg round to Alsace. It was with these hard geopolitical facts in mind that the French Empress Eugenie said to the Prussian ambassador after Königgrätz, with a nation like yours as a neighbor, we French are in danger of finding you in Paris one day unannounced. I will go to sleep French and I will wake up Prussian. Napoleon III was more specific about the threat telling the British Foreign Secretary in 1868, if Bismarck draws the South German states into the North German Confederation, our guns will go off by themselves. Knowing all of this, Bismarck very deliberately created the conditions for a third war of German unification. Great crises, Bismarck liked to say, provide the weather for Prussia's growth. Bismarck had created a crisis in 1866, using a quarrel over the spoils of the first German war of unification, to provoke the Austrian emperor into declaring war on him in what became the second war of German unification. He needed another crisis to cast Prussia as the blameless defender of German sovereignty and to isolate France, the inevitable adversary after 1866. Bismarck knew that the Prussian people, with the memory of 1866 fresh, would hesitate to embark on a new war with France, which was a far more formidable adversary than Austria. Bismarck knew that South German resistance to Prussian rule would be deep, and that the old Junkers and perhaps the Prussian king himself would hesitate to add so many Catholics to the North German state. He had to break the hold of the South German princes and reach past them to their more willing subjects. A few years earlier, Bismarck had remarked, there is but one ally for Prussia, the German people. Like him, they wanted a German nation state. If France declared war on Prussia, Germany, if France pre presented Prussia, Germany with a mortal threat, they would probably pressure their princely regime to fight. And so Bismarck stoked several crises, hoping that one of them would trigger Napoleon III's wrath. And finally one did, the candidate question for the Spanish throne. Napoleon III rushed headlong into the trap laid by Bismarck. And in this way, he solved all of the Prussian leaders' problems. We must remember that on the eve of war in 1870, Bismarck's problems were apparently as grave as Napoleon III's. Bismarck's wrangles with the Prussian legislature 
the North German Reichstag and the German Zoll Parliament, as well as the various German governments were so severe that he increasingly retreated to Watzin, the 20,000 acre Pomeranian estate gifted to him after Königlitz. He hated his complicated new role as Bundeskanzler, federal chancellor of the North German Confederation. Trees mean more to me than humans, Bismarck grumbled in this period. The Junkers, after 1866, blocked his efforts to subject Prussia, the heart of the North German Confederation, to new German laws and taxes. The new member states of the North German Confederation also balked at the new taxes levied by Berlin. Hesha Darmstadt went so far as to inquire in Paris about the possibility of French military protection against Prussia. Imagine a member of the new North German Confederation discreetly reaching out to French officials and saying, will you protect us if we wish to break away from this new confederation? Prussian national liberals, Bismarck's erstwhile foes, who had rallied to him only after the victory of 1866, tried to cut the military budget while the Prussian army tried to exceed its budget. Those same liberals also criticized Bismarck's cautious haste formula for unification, Eile mit Weile. They wanted unification now. Socialism was blooming in the mining and industrial towns of Germany, the workers condemning Bismarck's wars of annexation. The South German states continued to put distance between themselves and Berlin. Lieber Französisch als Preußisch was a common South German electoral slogan at the time. Indeed, in February 1870, just a few short months before the Franco-Prussian War broke out, Bavarian voters ousted the pro-Prussian government that had served since 1867 with the aid of Prussian subsidies and returned the devoutly Catholic pro-independence pro-French Patriot Party to power. The crisis of the Hohenzollern candidacy for the Spanish throne was the third in a string of attempts by Bismarck to goad the touchy, declining French emperor into declaring war on Prussia. Bismarck was seeking what he called the talisman that will unify Germans, the red rag that will taunt the Gallic bull. First, he had floated the idea of a Kaiser title for the Prussian king. Then he had financed an Italian railway through Switzerland that, given Italy's military alliance with Prussia in 1866, seemed to threaten and encircle France. After that second move, Napoleon III had replaced his dovish foreign minister, Napoleon Daru, with a hawk. Duke Antoine Aguinor de Gramont. Gramont called himself the Bismarck Francais. The next rebuff from Bismarck will mean war, Gramont said in May 1870. Bismarck searched for the outcome that would make Prussia the victim and France the aggressor. He needed to trigger the military alliances he had concluded after 1866 with the South German states and ensure the neutrality of the other great powers in order to wage a third war of German, <clears throat> a third war of German unification. First, he proffered the Prussian king's Catholic nephew as a candidate for the vacant Spanish throne. Spain accepted the Hohenzollern candidate. Napoleon III, Eugenie and Gramont spoke of Prussian perfidy, malice, and recklessness, and they threatened war. The Prussians withdrew the candidate in July. Bismarck then edited the famous Ems dispatch, just enough to insult the French, yet remove the cause for war. Napoleon III ran headlong into the trap, making impertinent and impossible demands that the Prussian king link himself formally to the renunciation, not just the Hohenzollern nephew, and that the Prussian king promised never again to put anyone forward for the Spanish throne. Well, that was going too far. 
Europe had been relieved by the passing of the crisis without war. Now France, not Prussia, seemed to be the warmonger. Bismarck deftly reversed the attempted French humiliation of Prussia and put unbearable pressure on France to attack. Well, the French declared war in mid-July 1870, alienating the other great powers and galvanizing the German people just as Bismarck had intended. He now turned the third war of German unification over to Moltke, who, thanks to the adhesion of the South Germans, who enthusiastically joined the war when the French showed their teeth, could invade France on a broad front with 25 North German divisions in two armies and a third army of 12 South German divisions. Bismarck and Moltke had worried that the South Germans wouldn't do their bit. They had refused to provide the South German armies with the excellent large-scale Prussian Kriegskarten war maps, forcing the South Germans to campaign in 1870 with road atlases purchased at bookshops. But it all came together in the war. The obstacles to German unification swept away and a new power created. Bismarck and Moltke were its architects, for better and worse. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure. Wonderful, great. Um, so we're, we're building up a lovely picture here of the kind of contrasting geopolitics and the, the political kind of feelings of these tensions between a German and a, and a Prussian uh, uh, war. Um, we'll move on to um, Christoph next, um, but can I just remind people if you have a question, please pop it in the Q&A and I'll keep gathering them as we go along so we can, we can group them together. Um, but Christoph. Thank you very much, uh, Anna, and ladies and gentlemen. It's a privilege and at the same time a great pleasure for me to talk to this uh, distinguished audience. In June 1871, Berlin hosted the victory parade of the young German Empire. This event turned Unter den Linden into a road of triumph. Among the elaborate statues and pictures along the alley, two portraits stood out. Those of Helmut von Moltke, chief of the general staff, and Otto von Bismarck, Chancellor of the North German Federation and Minister President of Prussia. You should see the picture right now. The portraits were created by Adolf Menzel, who would become one of the leading artists of the empire. Menzel showed Moltke as military commander equipped with binoculars ready to survey the battlefield. Interestingly enough, the artist painted Bismarck in a quite similar manner. The portrait shows the chancellor in the uniform of a general leaning over a map of France. As maps stood for mastering space, they were usually associated with the virtues of a military commander. By the unique arrangement, Menzel's portraits underlined the military qualities of both Moltke and Bismarck. Interestingly enough, the artist established a sort of equivalence between the two by conferring on them the Grand Cross of the Iron Cross, a decoration Bismarck actually never received. These paintings somewhat contradict our common view of the civil military relations during the Franco Prussian War. Okay, Bismarck Molke, thank you. Historical research has often interpreted this conflict in the light of the Sonderweg thesis. Claims that Germany followed a special path in history where she drifted off the Western course, marked by democratic civilian control over the military. Notable examples of that are the Third Reich or the military dictatorship established by Ludendorff during the First World War. In the light of what happened during the Age of Extremes, as Eric Hobsbawm called it, research on the Franco Prussian War largely followed a somewhat dualistic interpretation. In this context, Bismarck is considered a statesman representing political leadership, while Moltke favored military command and destruction, thereby demanding even a say in the political decision-making process. This interpretation regularly portrays Bismarck as a man with superior political insight who struggled to keep politically ambitious generals in check. I will question this view by analyzing the war not in the light of the 20th century, 
but by situating it in the 19th. I assume that dividing the problem into two separate fields, the civilian domain here, the military there, gives us a too simplistic as dualistic image of the events and neglects the complexity of 19th century decision-making process. Here, Sir Michael Howard's blended book on the Franco-Prussian War, which uh, most of us uh, have probably read again prior to this conference, marks a good starting point. In a thoughtful remark, Howard pointed out that in 1870, the spheres of civil and military authority overlapped as they always will, and nobody could tell precisely where the line of distinction should be drawn. Building on Howard's observation, I would like to question the um, dualistic view that the political and the military sphere should be regarded as well-defined and separate ideals. Instead, I propose a historicizing perspective and consider them as fields of meaning, which the contemporaries interpreted differently. Thus, the correlation of certain issues to the political or to the military fields is understood as a negotiation progress and a process. And as we will see, not least a power struggle among the Prussian decision makers, most notably Bismarck and Moltke. I will try to approach this issue in two steps. Firstly, I will give an outline of Bismarck's military career until the beginning of the war, showing how a politician became a general and in 1870, Bismarck ranked major general. And secondly, I will analyze the strife between Bismarck and Moltke during the conflict. One may have the impression that the Iron Chancellor was a died in the wool soldier, but that was not the case. During his lifetime, he had an ambivalent attitude towards the armed forces and their leaders. In 1838, young Bismarck joined the Königliche Gardejäger in Potsdam, from where I speak today, after he failed to convince the authorities that he suffered from a muscle weakness in his right arm. One year later, Bismarck already left the army as NCO. What followed was an average reservist career. Later, when Bismarck became Prussian diplomat, that aroused suspicion at the court. Crown Prince and future King William lamented that ambassadorship was assigned to this lieutenant of the territorial army. Obviously, military rank and experience were seen as essential features of the Prussian elite. Here, as anywhere in Europe, noblemen and many state officials were provided with military ranks and uniforms which were regarded as symbols of loyalty and signs of belonging. The uniform bearer showed his allegiance to his monarch together with his affiliation to the state and the army. This background explains why Bismarck's makeshift military career took off when he became Prussian ambassador and was sent to St. Petersburg and later to Paris in 1862 when he became major. Obviously, Bismarck should be able to keep up with the reputation and prestigious uniforms of those he was dealing with in the European capitals. After the war against Austria in 1866, King William appointed Bismarck Major General, and you might notice that he thereby skipped two ranks. The king attached him to the prestigious Magdeburger Cuirassier Regiment Nummer 7 two years later. From then on, Bismarck frequently chose the flamboyant white uniform of the cuirassier with his, with his characteristic yellow color while performing governmental duties. After 1866, the uniform became his work attire and trademark. The Franco-Prussian War fueled this image. During the first weeks when all went rather successfully, Bismarck hardly was concerned with matters of warfare. Nevertheless, Bismarck adopted certain habits of a soldier. When William Russell met Bismarck, the British war correspondent noted that he certainly bore more resemblance in his outward aspect to a soldier than to a statesman. To Molke's irritation, Bismarck's self-confidence grew as the German troops advanced victoriously into France. When after Sedan both passed cheering soldiers, Bismarck confidently remarked, they all recognized my curious cap, neglecting the fact that the men presumably 
honored the well-known architect of the military triumph as well. Later, in the course of the People's War after Sedan, the relationship between Bismarck, Moltke, and other members of the military elite soured. In September, Paris was under siege, but the new Republican government of national defense continued fighting. France constantly raised new armies, which were repeatedly beaten, but yet no peace was in sight. Facing the stalemate, Molke agreed with a letter that had been found in one of the balloons that managed to leave Paris, and I cite this source for our French colleagues. Les Prussiens ne peuvent pas entrer à Paris, et nous ne pouvons pas les enchausser. As nobody could present a handed receipt for ending the conflict, a struggle over how to win the war unfolded. Soon, the complex structure of Prussian civil military relations came to bear. During the war, Prussian decision making took place in a triangle of leadership, as the historian Stig Förster has rather fittingly called it, with King William at the top. But as no single person could master the increasingly complex task of exercising supreme command and steering the state's administration, William relied on Bismarck and Moltke. Both acted as his supervisors and formed the lower edges of the triangle. In the end, Prussia went to war without having a plain command and control structure. As a result, decision making took place in a complex process of negotiation within the triangle. Its resources were personality, authority, and power, together with a special relationship with the king who had the final say. Molke assumed that he and Bismarck were equals under the king, with the chief of staff slightly in front due to the imperatives of war. While Molke basically acknowledged political leadership during peacetime, in wartime he advocated a military command that should operate completely independently from any political interference. Bismarck, on the other hand, had a nearly all-embracing understanding of policy and considered himself the supreme advisor to the king who was in charge of Prussia's overall policy. Bismarck even did not refrain from approaching issues that Moltke felt to be within his authority. During the winter campaign, both sides struggled over the question of how to end the war. More than once, Bismarck stated that the purpose of war is to achieve peace, an idea that Moltke approved. The means to effectively end the war were military, and here both strongly disagreed. Moltke wanted to crush the military capabilities of France in order to prevent any future attack on the German lands, no matter how long that might take. Bismarck disapproved and advocated a speedy end of the war because he feared that the other great powers might intervene. In December, Bismarck started to send a series of detailed dispatches to the king. They concerned the future course of the war and regularly began with an explanation of why the chancellor dealt with military issues. Bismarck regularly spoke of an indispensable interaction between political leadership and military operations, which in his opinion, could not be considered separately from one another. By putting military matters in a political framework, in a Tessic-Auswitzian sense, if you like, he aimed at legitimizing his military proposals, thus implying that he was aware of his incursion into a field the general staff claimed to be his memorial domain. Now, Bismarck went so deeply into military considerations that I could have borne the signature of Moltke as well. Bismarck expressed the need to intensify the pressure on the French people so that they finally long for peace. In order to achieve this aim, Bismarck proposed that fewer prisoners should be taken on the battlefield, thereby deterring recruits to join the army where they were more likely to expect death than imprisonment. In Bismarck's opinion, the Germans were too lenient in their treatment of the occupied territories. Pontureur had to be punished harshly and relentlessly, Bismarck's words, thereby holding even the population accountable by inflicting collective punishment. Here, one might notice the influence of Philip Sheridan, 
the infamous Union General who devastated Shenandoah Valley during the US Civil War. In 1870, uh, in 1870 Sheridan joined the Prussian headquarters where he found the German campaigning was more a vast picnic than like actual war. Bismarck's chilling proposals clearly exceeded the measures taken um, by the general staff. Even if its forces committed extreme acts of violence, Moltke tried to contain the worst excesses of people's war, which he considered as a regression to barbarism. As this example shows, the dualist image of the statesman who epitomized peace and order and who, during the franco prussian War, struggled to contain rampant generals advocating destruction falls apart. Instead, it was reversed. This time, Bismarck submitted ideas that were more brutal than anything the general staff had ordered. In his dispatches to the king, Bismarck even put operational planning under review. Such a critique was rather uncommon in an era when, according to a humor humorous remark, there were five perfect things in Europe, the curia of the Catholic Church, the British Parliament, the Russian Ballet, the French Opera, and the German general staff. So we may find in Bismarck's behavior a sign of the self-confidence and rigorousness of the chancellor. It's hardly surprising that the general staff became furious about Bismarck's dispatches. By speaking of Bismarck as a civilian in a curacier's uniform, its members acidly emphasized that they drew a clear line between soldiers and what they considered as civilians, even if they wore a uniform. To Molke's indignation, Bismarck now regularly entered into professional discourse like a military specialist, be it during the king's councils or at the dinner table. An officer thus moaned that Bismarck entirely behaved as a general. Obviously, the chancellor linked rank with expertise and a claim for power. Indeed, the balance seemed to shift towards Bismarck's cause. On, on December 17, the king ordered the general staff to keep Bismarck informed about future operations. Later, in January 1871, when it came to fix the terms of surrender for Paris, the chancellor had his way. When in February, an army corps was inquiring how to deal with the French general Loisel, who declined to act according to the armistice agreement, Bismarck instructed the corps to threaten him with attack. Moltke commented this episode bitterly. I'm curious to know whether Count Bismarck will also give the order to strike. Dear colleagues, at the climax of the war, we find Moltke in a defensive position. The chief of the general staff insisted on a dualist stance, struggling to keep the two lower edges of the triangle separate. He thought this argument fit to repel what he considered legitimate incursions into his domain. But finally, Moltke failed against an adversary that might remind us of Stevenson's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, a literary figure that combined diverse and contradictory characteristics. During the Franco-Prussian War, Bismarck not only performed as a statesman, but acted as a general as well. Bismarck's action did not fit into a dualistic model of civil-military relations a concept with which research oftentimes analyzed the Franco-Prussian War. Perhaps you remember Mansell's colorful portraits, which also attributed to Bismarck the virtues of a military commander. They impressively illustrate that at that time, even the wider public drew no distinct line between the political and the military domains. As I suggested here, this was the case even among the um, decision makers who acted within a governmental system that left space for negotiation, thus depending on personality and authority. Obviously, the question of whom and what determined the future course of the German Empire lay in the hands of the politic particular um, office holders. Thank you, Christoph. Wonderful. That stretches us out now into the civil military relations. Um, and, and it's a lovely embedding uh, into 19th century and trying to pull that back into that context. 
Um, we finish off then um, with Karine, who's going to come and talk to us about European neutrality and the isolation of the French Republic, September 1870 to March 1871. Karine, if you're there. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so I'm going to begin by sharing my screen. Um, so I hope everybody um, can see my um, screen there. So, well, firstly, thank you very much. Um, sorry, um, Corinne, sorry, just to interrupt, did you want to um, go into a full screen mode just so your, your PowerPoints? Okay, yep. We just had a few comments that it might be easier yep. for people to see. Okay, yeah, okay, thanks very much. Um, so, yeah, I just want to start by thanking the organisers for this conference, a really exciting um, couple of days of papers. Uh, so, I'm going to be talking about uh, the French situation and, in particular, focusing on the isolation of the French Republic um, following Saddam. Now, it's traditionally been argued that one of the main outcomes of the Franco-Prussian War um, and the German victory in the Franco-Prussian War was the victory of might over rights that 19th century ideas on international law and the European concert had given way to an aggressive, conservative-infused uh, nationalism. And it has been described as marking a turning point when realpolitik and power politics prevailed over restraint encouraged by the concert system and the values of international law and that this helped create an, the international climate that led to the outbreak of the First World War. According to this narrative, the lack of military or direct diplomatic intervention by the other European powers represented an abrogation of morality, right and justice as well as the abandonment of the principles that had underpinned the European concert since the Napoleonic Wars. What I want to suggest today is a more nuanced picture than that of French isolation amidst European hostility and indifference. Focusing on the period after Sedan, I want to suggest that the French Republic not only mobilized a significant swathe of European public opinion, the press, humanitarian organizations and volunteer competence, but that the more the war went on, the more the French Republic prioritized these aspects over its military effort. In no real prospect of victory, its aim was to transform the war from a military conflict into, uh, between two nations into a transnational struggle over the values that defined Europe and the wider world. At the outbreak of the war, France found itself militarily and diplomatically isolated in Europe, largely because of the mistakes and assumptions that had been made by Napoleon III's government, and because of the widespread assumption that France would win. Potential partners such as Austria and Italy never made good on the positive no noises that they made to French diplomats and the preparations for any military in intervention were either stood down or never put into place. Meanwhile, Bismarck played upon European suspicions of French expansionism, appealing to the British government by leaking earlier French plans to incorporate Luxembourg and Belgium, and secretly promising the Russian government support for its plans to renounce the Black Sea uh, clauses of the 1856 Treaty of Paris. Matters didn't improve after Sudan, France became a republic in a sea of conservative monarchies and empires. European governments saw it as a threat to the existing orders within their own states and empires, stirring up revolutionary elements and rousing nationalist movements. Russian ministers labeled the new French Republic a, quote, perpetual nightmare, threatening to revive unrest in Poland. But whereas, as Stacey Goddard has argued, Bismarck forestalled European intervention by using rhetoric that appealed to shared norms in international relations, the French government did the very opposite. From the outset, the government of national defense was uncompromising in its rhetoric. Ministers believed that because the French Republic incarnated the universal values of reason, progress, and liberty, 
It projected itself onto a wider international canvas, fighting not for its own national interest, but for the values of an international community. As such, French ministers believed that they had a duty not to compromise or to surrender to German demands. And here we see um, in the poster, particularly on the right, um, these references to the 1790s and to the Revolutionary Wars. Now, these beliefs of the French Republic were most clearly manifested in the circular by the new foreign minister, Jules Favre, on the 6th of September, 1870. Favre argued that it was Napoleon III's regime, not the French Republic, that was responsible for war, and that since that regime had fallen, Prussia had no right to continue the war or to demand any French territory in the peace terms. To do so, Favre argued, would be in contravention of the European values of, huma of humanity, reason, and science. In consequence, Favre insisted, France would, quote, not cede an inch of its soil, nor a stone of any fortress, end quote. The problem was, of course, that the prevailing view across European governments was that the demand for Alsace-Moselle was a legitimate condition of peace, especially as Bismarck framed it in terms of German security. And even Gladstone, who opposed territorial annexation without consulting the people, said that the French government were insane, not only to refuse what he described as moderate German terms in late September 1870, but to treat them as a moral outrage and to continue fighting a war that they couldn't win. There was therefore a significant disjuncture between French and European perspectives on the justification um, for war as the French government sought to turn the narrative away from the legitimacy of its initial causes to the legitimacy of its conduct and, con and continuation. Now, although none of the other European states intervened militarily or explicitly took, took sides diplomatically, neutrality didn't mean passivity, a lack of interest or powerlessness. As Marja Eben Huiz has argued, neutrality was used by major states in the mid to late 19th century as a means of maintaining peace through restraint. Both sides, however, sought to stretch and challenge the meaning of neutrality. Bismarck asked the British and Russian governments to adopt an approach of benevolent neutrality towards Prussia. In the case of Russia, as early as February 1868, Bismarck had assured the Chancellor Gorchakov that he would support the proposed renunciation of the Black Sea clauses of the Treaty of Paris in exchange for Russia promising to send 100,000 men to the Austrian border to deter Austrian intervention on the French side. In the case of Britain, Bismarck appealed to past alliances against France in the Napoleonic Wars. But if the Foreign Secretary, Lord Granville, rejected the notion of benevolence as being incompatible with neutrality, as they witnessed the successive German victories, the British, as well as the Italian, the Austrian, and even Russian governments, became increasingly aware that non-intervention was not neutral in its political and military implications. European neutrality served Bismarck's aim of a short, limited war. But despite French efforts to portray non-intervention as a kind of malign neutrality, harmful not just to the European balance, but to European civilization, no change of policy ensued. <clears throat> Being unable to persuade European governments to support its cause, it was to European opinion that the French government turned instead. Jufav described the new French administration, the Republican administration, as a government of publicity, whose actions should be conducted openly so that the people might judge its actions hour by hour. 
Its every decision was therefore closely bound up with the desire to elicit p particular responses from the public and thus to stir a moral outrage against the legitimacy of German victory. As the war went on, so the French campaign became less about the military or even diplomatic objectives and more about the pursuit of European and global opinion. In their testimonies to the National Assembly inquiry that was held after the war, senior French officials affirmed that the government believed that by offering a vision of defiant resistance, they would earn the respect of Europe. Prolonged suffering, greater losses and even worse peace conditions were a price that they considered worth paying in order to win the war of opinion. Now, one of the greatest hurdles for French ministers was turning international opinion away from viewing France as the aggressor to persuading it that it was the victim. The French government therefore engaged upon an international propaganda campaign to claim that the, since the values of the Republic were universal, by waging a barbaric war against France, Prussia was really waging a barbaric war against European civilization. When the bombardment of Paris began in early January 1871, Jules Favre appealed directly to European governments and public opinion, accusing Prussia of violating international law by targeting homes, hospitals, schools and churches without warning, and of violating moral laws in attacking the capital of civilization. Now, the French and German governments repeatedly accused each other of breaching the 1864 Geneva Convention. Red Cross ambulances and voluntary humanitarian relief organizations from 12 neutral countries were witness to the violations. But it was the French allegations that resonated most widely in international opinion. In October 1870, the French government released a list of alleged atrocities that had been committed by the Germans to the international press, provoking horror and outrage in many countries. Favre followed this up with a diplomatic circular tying what he described as Prussia's war of extermination with the wider French narrative of offences against republican and universal principles of justice, law and civilization. And this image, I mean, this painting was actually done, of course, um, in 1896, but it was part of this narrative that began during the war of these German violations um, of these international um, agreements, Geneva in particular, uh, of German forces targeting civilians and notoriously, of course, in um, the episode of Bazay. Now, the French narrative had a ready audience thanks to the enormous global appetite for news about the Franco-Prussian War. Episodes such as the, as the alleged Bavarian massacre of French civilians at Bazay gained international notoriety, being splashed across newspaper front pages. As we can see here in the Illustrated London News, which um, shows us this image of the so-called massacre at Bazay, which, as it turned out, of course, turned uh, proved to be uh, rather exaggerated, rather more exaggerated than was the reality. Seasoned war reporters such as William Howard Rus Russell of the Times helped swing public sympathies round to the French side with vivid accounts of the suffering of both French soldiers and civilians. But it was perhaps above all the Prussian siege and bombardment of Paris that horrified international opinion. The Lord Mayor of London launched a public appeal that raised 250,000 francs to pay for food convoys to be sent to Paris as soon as the siege was lifted. And similar efforts were witnessed in Belgium, Russia, Canada and the United States. In Britain, Public meetings were held across the major cities, including Manchester, Birmingham, Glasgow and Edinburgh, in support of the French Republic. 
one of the largest was held at Trafalgar Square on the 19th of September 1870, in which a reported 10 to 20,000 people attended. French Republican uh, rhetoric resonated with nationalist groups in the Balkans and in Poland in particular, many seeing the French campaign as part of a shared international struggle for freedom against tyranny. But as the war went on, international sympathy widened beyond liberal and socialist supporters of the French Republic. French diplomats reported favorable opinion in Austria and Italy, and even in autocratic Russia, the French ambassador reported public and press sympathy towards France's suffering. But it was perhaps above all the mobilization of international volunteer combatants that showed how the French Republic projected its vision of the war onto a transnational struggle for the values that it claimed to represent. The most famous volunteer was, of course, the 63-year-old veteran combatant Garibaldi, but he was just one of many. The army of the Vosges included 1,500 Greek volunteers, 500 from Italy, as well as soldiers from Poland, Spain, Switzerland, and Britain. And it wasn't only those who sympathized with Republican values. The French narrative of victimhood and German barbarity resonated more widely, mobilizing Catholic and conservative volunteers, such as Ronald MacIver from Scotland, who was both a monarchist and a Christian, as well as those who served in the Papal Zouave as part of the Volunteers of the West. And Ronald MacIver is, is pictured on the right. So to conclude then, the war began with international sympathy towards Prussia against French provocation. After the fall of Napoleon III, the French Republic sought to change international opinion and to shift discourse on the legitimacy uh, of the war away from French responsibility towards arguments about German moral and ethical conduct. The French Republic didn't persuade any European powers to intervene, but through its mobilization of public opinion, it challenged the moral legitimacy of the German victory. It also helped transform the Franco-Prussian War into a transnational shared experience for many Europeans that played out in the press and in relief efforts, and that raised wider questions about the values that defined late 19th century Europe. It helped transform ideas about nationalism, liberalism, and humanitarianism. And through its defiant rhetoric and resistance, the French Republic also helped mobilize the revolutionary left resonating through the rise of the Paris Commune and in international socialist movements, as I'm sure we'll hear more about later today. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you very much, Corinne. Um, a fabulously rich and interesting paper there. We have um, 15 minutes for q and I have two questions already uh, in the chat. So I'm gonna ask one very direct question to Karine to follow up on, on her paper. Uh, and then if anyone else wants to, you know, while you're just getting your ideas going, pop it in the q and I can, I can then um, uh, gather those for us. Um, so just to start us off, Karine, I thought, you know, this is a wonderfully rich way to kind of round off a panel on politics. And I wondered if um, you might say something about how um, press agencies in particular uh, transforming this landscape because you were talking about um, you know international opinion and and newspapers suddenly you know picking up these ideas but surely the the French have a huge advantage at this juncture in that they have one of the earliest and most developed international press agencies Havas and the Germans don't yet have an international press agency Wolf is still go, you know trying to get going and Bismarck will get that going as a response I think to the uh, Franco-Prussian War. So I just wondered how much are there material structures that are, are, are helping opinion and news around the world uh, to be shaped 
uh, in favour of this, this push towards a larger, as you put it, um, battle over values or, you know, on French terms. Okay, thanks very much um, for the question. Yeah, I think it's a, a really um, interesting point. Um, there is an agreement that is made between the two, uh, between the major news um, agencies just prior to the outbreak of the war to um, ensure global coverage of the war. So, you know, what we do see, I mean, this is something that we see over the course of the 19th century, of course, the development of war reporting. And of course, this is aided by the new infrastructures, the ability to to transmit news through the telegraph and so on. And we now also have, of course, these very experienced um, war reporters as well. But of course, I think, you know, although, as you say, there is this infrastructure that is in place and, you know, the French on the face of it would seem to be well placed. The problem is, of course, that the, the international view uh, at the outbreak of the war is very much against the French. Um, you know, we see this particularly in the British press, um, that the French are portrayed as being the aggressors, that they are responsible for this. And, you know, we see all this also with um, some of the senior reporters, the likes of William Howard Russell, who are um, there, you know, who are reporting, but who are sort of embedded um, with German forces as well. So there's very much... Um, a sense in which the, the those war that war reporting is very favourable to the German war effort at the beginning of the war, and it's only really later on that it starts to um, favour the, uh, the the French war efforts um, and start and you start to get that greater sympathy emerging for the French. But I think it is striking. I mean, um, some of the other. Um, uh, contributors to this conference, um, I can see the names who've done more research on the press and, and on this. Um, um, well, I'm sure we'll talk about this later today, but you know, it, it's really quite striking just how enormous the appetite was and just how um, the news about the Franco Prussian War really became dominant. You know, we, we see these. Uh, you know, figures like a, something like 60% of global news um, was about the siege of Paris uh, in the first week of January um, 1871. So, you know, there was huge interest, not just in France and Germany or even Europe, but globally um, about the franco prussian War. Fabulous. Thank you. Um, we might go to Jim Diggerman, if you can unmute yourself. You've got a, a nice uh, question that kind of opens up the whole panel to think about difference between what we're saying now and, and what um, Michael Howard has said in the past about the Franco-Prussian War. Can you unmute yourself? Yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to get a sense from the panel of how they feel the perceptions of the military balance vis-a-vis -vis Germany and France have changed in our perspectives because I don't have to tell an audience like this or the panel that we've had you know a huge amount of work going on for 60 or 70 years, which uh, Michael Howard, of course, was very important in uh, contributing to. But how do you see the perceptions and misperceptions of the military balance between each power? That is, could we win a war, not win a war? What could we succeed in doing and not succeed in doing? How is it new in what you see from now, uh, as opposed to what Howard wrote 60 years ago? Perhaps, um, uh, speakers, you can just unmute yourself as, as you'd like to enter and comment on that, if anyone would like to, to respond to that. Otherwise, um, please, speakers, you know, turn, turn your, your cameras on. I don't want to miss you. The other option is for me to ask a direct question and you keep mulling that over in your head. Uh, Oliver switched on. Go for it, Oliver. 
um, sorry, I, I don't think uh, really I'm I, I'm the most uh, um, <clears throat> indicated to 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 answer this this, uh, this question. Perhaps Jeffrey would be uh, far more precise than me. But just one point. Um, one of the most um, valuable and interesting direction in uh, in um, the last researches uh, to me now is um, the uh, com com comparative approach uh, in order to um, assess the quality and efficiency of uh, general staffs on both sides of the uh, of this war, and especially the way uh, French officers were uh, trained and, um, and recruited and used in this war by the generals, by the high command. Um, and I, I think that here we have really space of uh, a, new, um, a new direction, new approaches in order to perhaps uh, more accurately uh, understand uh, the very reasons of French underperformance, and uh, it is a uh, it is a, a really the word here underperformance during this war. So I would say uh, something new, perhaps, is this you know comparative approach um, uh, pointing to uh, or focused on the um, you know, comparative performance of uh, general steps. I, I would say it, and that perhaps that would that would uh, lead us to uh, view uh, French officers not as uh, bad as they are sometimes depicted uh, in the, the history of this war. Uh, it's, it's perhaps a matter of balance, but uh, well, I'm interested in this, in this subject uh, in order to, to answer the, the question. Yes, I should say something about the Prussian army. Um, the Prussian army was a quite self-confident army when the war broke out. Perhaps you can imagine that because uh, they won against Denmark. Okay, that was not the biggest war they, they ever waged, but they uh, um, were beating Austria in 1866 and uh, they went through a quite rigorous army reform in the 1860s. With what, which was conducted by uh, King William and uh, the War Minister Rohn. And um, this, this reform saw a reorganization of the army and a strengthening, enlargement of the army. And together with the reform the army had and um, the, the victorious wars in the recent past, the Prussians went to the Franco-Prussian War rather as a self-confident army because the German or the Prussian general staff system obviously um, worked very well. Please, Oliver, you, you wanted to jump back in? I, I don't want you to take the turn off perhaps Karine or someone else. I'll, I'll you know? bring Karine back in after this, yeah. Okay, just one, perhaps one last point. Um, uh, uh, I must confess I'm, uh, uh, for this question, I, I find, um, uh, really fascinating the the, the, uh, the the question of you know the balance between the um, colonial military experience or pre-colonial military experience of France at this time and uh, performance of French armies during this high intensity war uh, at the center of Europe. That is, um, is um, what what is the explanation for uh, French uh, underperformance uh, during the war? Of course, the quality of the high command. Of course, the um, perhaps relationships between civil, military, uh, and military uh, decision makers. And I found really the presentation of uh, Christophe uh, really uh, insightful and really uh, interesting from this point of view. Uh, but there is another question here that uh, leads us, and it is, it, it is really modern, and it is a question for France as for now, um, in our time, the balance between high intensity uh, skills uh, at war and expeditionary culture, uh, um, so-called colonial culture, uh, for example, in, in operations in Africa, uh, at this time in Mexico and, and, and so on. What is, the, what is the relationship between this quite mixed um, operational culture and 
the performance of French armies during the war? That, that's a very modern question. And uh, I think that uh, it is uh, one of the reasons that uh, can uh, lead us to consider the Franco-German war as a very, very interesting war for our time, if we can, if we try to, to, uh, to, to assess it from, uh, from our uh, point of view. Thank you. Corinne, did you want to address that? Um, just to add, just very briefly, I mean, I think that's a really good question. And actually, um, I think probably like everybody, all the speakers, you know, I still go back to um, Michael Howard's book. And I think it's still, you know, really, um, it, you know, it has stood the test of time. But I think the more recent research has really drawn attention in particular um, to the the ways in which we understand the role of um, irregular combatants. And there's been a lot of really interesting research as well in recent years that has been done on the debates about the conduct of the war and in particular the, the debates about um, the way the war was conducted in terms of um, kind of rules of war and um, humanitarian ideas and international law and what is and what isn't acceptable um, in the way that the war was conducted and, and in particular um, this debate about um, to what extent the Germans were, you know, sort of um, conducting war in a way that uh, was somehow bre breaching and, and these international laws. And this was particularly the, the French narrative. And there's been a, a lot of work uh, reassessing that and in particular um, linking that in with the way that the um, the First World War has been understood and particularly the, the stories of the atrocities in 1914. So I think, you know, we can connect developments in the scholarship on the franco prussian War with um, the developments in the scholarship on the First World War as well. Absolutely. Um, I, I'm going to bring Philip Mead in, who has a question for Christoph, because it, it develops quite nicely on Oliver's response to these questions. Oliver said, you know, one way to think about this and push it forward is to think comparatively. Philip has a comparative question for Christoph. Do you want to unmute, Philip? Hello? We can hear you. Alt. We can hear you, Philip, if you want to ask your question. Hello? Um, Philip, if you can't hear me, I'll, I can ask the question. I'll just give him one more second to to have a go. Okay, I'll ask the question. Um, Hello. Uh, I, I don't know how to re-mute <laughs> Philip. Um, uh, Christoph, Philip asks, um, uh, in Bismarck's blurring uh, an overlap of a military civil Hello. authority. Sorry. Um... And Uh, and I'll just keep reading the question, and the public's own conflation of these two areas, did this not also occur with France during the war itself, this civil military overlap? Um, what does Dr. Nubel uh, see as distinctly and singularly Bismarckian in the way the German Chancellor transgressed the civil military divide during the war? Uh, thank you for this interesting question. I think there is some kind of uh, intermingling between the military and the civil sphere in France as well. Uh, this especially applies to the Napoleonic age when Napoleon, of course, um, went to the public in uniform, dressed in uniform, because he, as uh, the Prussian king, uh, Wilhelm I, uh, commanded uh, the political and the military sphere. But later, this changed a bit, and at the same time, the military was in again, and I mean the government of national defense and uh, General uh, Trochu, um, he, was, uh, the he was leading um, the, the government, but at the same time he was general and he was uh, the commander of the city of Paris. So you have this overlap of the both tiers uh, again. But if you uh, consider the iconography of uh, the, the French government, how it um, it represented uh, itself, you can see uh, them appearing mostly in uh, 
well, in civil clothes and not, not in uniform. So um, the government of national defense brought a distinction here between governmental duties and um, military duties. Uh, whereas Bismarck regularly performs in uniform because it's, he followed some somewhat uh, Prussian court regulation. So perhaps this was not Bismarck's choice to, to uh, uh, deliberately to, to uh, wear uniform, but um, he had to, and he made use of it. And I think, well, the Bismarckian um, aspect here is perhaps less Bismarck, well, well, yes, his power attitude is very Bismarckian. So his, his claim for power is, enormous authority within the Prussian Triangle. This is Bismarckian, but the structure um, is not, has not been made by Bismarck because he, he found the structure in 1862 when he became Prussian minister president and he um, claimed to the structure and uh, he never um, attempted to change it. So the army was very strong in, in Prussia and he never tried to, to, to um, well, uh, some kind of delegitimize or, or, or keep the army uh, far from power. So um, what I want to say is, yes, there is some kind of um, idea Bismarck had in uh, while performing his duties. But on the other hand, he worked in, in this particular Prussian uh, governmental structure. Great, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, I think we need to leave it there. We've got a whole host of questions that are still um, that we're going to have to leave. Um, suffice to say, the kind of the direction of the questions seem to be pushing towards this comparative or thinking about the international identification. So very much um, picking up on comments all speakers have made, and you know, with those ending comments from Karine in, in trying to make a step back and think internationally about this. Um, so I'll hand it over to Michael, who will um, uh, tell us what's next. <laughs> Great, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Anna, for, for um, sharing so wonderfully coolly and <laughs> efficiently, not being thrown by anything. And thanks, you know, above all to our four panellists. I, I think all the papers kind of gelled and spoke to each other. So um, they're individually good, but also more than the sum of their parts. So now we have um, half an hour or so, so we'll be reconvening at 11 o'clock for panel two of the Franco-Prussian War of Forging a Modern France, um, which will be chaired by Dr. Talita Elakwa. So um, yeah, we've got time for some coffee, or if you're on the sort of eastern seaboard of the United States, uh, a sort of midnight refrigerate, I guess, uh, might be uh, in order now. So um, thanks very much. <laughs>